And welcome back, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Parable of the Vineyard YouTube Torah portion live study. We are at week 29, Ahare Mot, after the death. It is Leviticus chapters 16, 17, and 18. And we'll be talking about uh, the scapegoat, Azazel, which we'll find out in a little bit, the Day of Atonement, cleanliness, and some pretty simple stuff like not sleeping with your relatives, no bestiality, and no homosexuality. So before we get into it, I just want to say a few things. Uh, if you're new, if you just happen to come across us by chance, my name is Adam, your host, and I am just a student of the Torah, and I've been called to study it, and I invite you to be study partners with me. I'm not some great wise old teacher, just a student of the Torah, and uh, again, I invite you to study alongside with me. So uh, before we get into it, let's uh, start with a little bit of prayer. And maybe even a shofar blast? Yeah, it's not too late, considering we didn't get to do one on Friday. So, um, yeah, so let's bow our hearts. Heavenly Father, Yahuwah Most High, uh, we just come before you in Yahusha's name, and we thank you for this opportunity to study together um, all across your earth. And we just pray that you open our eyes and ears to the wonderful things out of your Torah that we may understand, uh, grow thereby, and uh just continue to cultivate our heart that we may bring forth uh, the fruit that you've so desired from man. Uh, we bless you and thank you so much for reconciling us back to you through Messiah Yahusha and his offering his blood for us. And uh, we thank you so much for opening our eyes to the majesty and the relevancy and the beauty of your Torah. In Yahusha's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome, welcome, brothers and sisters. Okay, so let's do... Yeah, let's do a quick one. What do you think? Okay. All right. So let's um, let's get right into it because we got quite a bit to go over. Um, and uh, for those of you that are here with me tonight, sorry I couldn't do this on Friday night, but we were doing second Passover, which was awesome. And uh, so I wasn't able to, to be live. So here we are on Monday night. And uh, we only got a couple more weeks of Leviticus, and we're already into numbers. So, man, this year is going by fast. So Leviticus 16, verse 1. Give me a moment, and we will get started. Give me just a moment. Let me just take a look at the chat real quick. Uh... Okay, looks like looks good. Okay, sounds good. Let's get on it then. So Leviticus sixteen one, and we will be reading from the Sefer version. Sefer version you can get uh, uh, you can get for free on eSword. You can download it for free. You can get the app for free and read the sixty six books. Uh, you can upgrade for a nominal fee to get the removed books like Enoch and Jasher and Jubilees. Uh, there's tons of great options out there. The Hallelujah Scriptures, the, the TS-1998, the TS-2009. Um, but this just happens to be my favorite one. So here we go. Leviticus uh, 16.1. And Yahuwah spoke unto Moshe after the death of the two sons of Aharon, when they offered before Yahuwah and died. And Yahuwah said unto El Moshe, Speak unto Aharon, your brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place, within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Thus shall Aharon come into the holy place, with a young bullock for a sin offering, and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and shall be girded with a linen belt. And with a linen turban shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. And he shall take of the assembly of the children of Yashrael two kids of the goats for a sin offering, and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aharon shall offer his bullock of sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats and present them before Yahuwah at the door of the tabernacle of the assembly. And Aharon shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for Yahuwah and the other lot for Azazel. So in like, for example, 
Um, for example, here, so like in the KJV that a lot of us are used to, uh, it says, and the Sefer got it right. So we just read here, we read verse uh, 8, the other lot for Azazel. So normally a lot of us know this as the scapegoat, and this is a term that's even used today. A scapegoat, right? Like everything is just put on this one person, and he, this person's like the fall guy, the scapegoat. And so that's kind of what we're talking about here is that Azazel is the scapegoat. And I'll read a few more verses and then we'll actually pause and talk about why this scapegoat is Azazel. And Aharon shall bring the goat upon which Yahuwah's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be for Azazel shall be presented alive before Yahuwah to make an atonement with him and to let him go for Azazel into the wilderness. So let's stop here and let's talk about this for a second. So this is, again, this is the uh, the Day of Atonement. And uh, this was actually the only day out of the year that they were allowed to go into uh, the most holy place. Otherwise, no, no, off limits. So that was once a year they would go in and do this. And you saw here that, all, first of all, Aharon had to make a sin offering for himself first and then for the people, right? And that's, that's kind of some of the stuff we read about in Hebrews. I think it's chapter 7. Uh, might as well actually tell you what. Might as well just look it up real quick. I think it's Hebrews 7. Um, yeah, here we go. This is talking about, of course, Yahusha, our high priest forever now. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself, right? So Messiah Husha did it once and for all. Whoops, wrong tab. He did it once and for all, and he doesn't have to offer up sin for himself. Why? Because he was uh, this spotless lamb. He was sinless. But let's talk about why this scapegoat is for Azazel. Now, some of you that are uh, familiar with um, the book of Enoch, you probably already know. But just to show you here that the Sefer got it right, this is uh, Leviticus 16.8. You can see here what it says, um, And Aharon shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for Yahuwah and the other lot for the scapegoat. And you can see H5799, uh, Hazazel, right? Azazel is the Hebrew word here. And it was only used four times, and we're going to read all four times tonight, um, all in Leviticus. You got it here in verse 8, where we just read, twice in verse 10, and once in verse 26, which we'll read just shortly. But this is straight up Azazel. And where this comes from, you can only find this really in the book of Enoch. And we're going to read chapter 10 of Enoch. Then said the Most High, the Holy and Great One spake and sent Uriel to the sons of Lamech, and said to him, Go to Noah, and tell him in my name, Hide thyself, and reveal to him the end that is approaching, that the whole earth will be destroyed, and a deluge is about to come upon the whole earth, and will destroy all that is on it. And now instruct him that he may escape, and his seed may be preserved for all the generations of the world. And again, Yahuwah said to Raphael, Bind Azazel hand and foot, and cast him into the darkness, and to make an opening in the desert, which is in Dudael. Which uh, we already read, right? Um, oh, we actually didn't even read this yet, but it, what we're going to read here just shortly is that um, the scapegoat, Azazel, right? For Azazel, it actually, they ascended out into the desert, right? To, 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 to wander into the wilderness. So again here, bind Azazel hand and foot and cast him into the darkness and make an opening in the desert which is in Dudael and cast him therein and place upon him rough and jagged rocks and cover him with darkness and let him abide there forever and cover his face that he may not see light. And on the great day of judgment he shall be cast into the fire and heal the earth which the angels have corrupted and proclaim the healing of the earth that they may heal the plague and that all the children of men may not perish through all the secret things that the watchers have disclosed and have taught their sons. Now listen clear here, listen closely. And the whole earth has been corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel, 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 Azazel. To him ascribe all sin, right? So this is the 
scapegoat. So they're putting it all on him because he's the one that, um, you know, he's the one that taught men wickedness. And, uh, you know, different versions have different names for the serpent, you know, in the garden or Hasatan that went into the serpent in the garden. Jubilees makes that pretty clear that uh, it was Hasatan that actually went into the serpent or the dragon. That's a whole nother, that's a whole nother topic, right? But um, uh, the one that seduced Eve, right? Later on in this book, it also calls him Gadriel. Um, so anyways, but so again, so... Um, to him ascribe all sins. So everything is put on Azazel. And let's see, do we need to go any further? No, we'll stop right there. So yeah, this is the root of the Day of Atonement and why we have the scapegoat, a.k.a. Azazel. And we're going to find out here in a little bit that he's going to be sent into the desert, which uh, actually I wanted to keep that up because I wanted to reference it again in his second. So let's keep reading. So verse, we just read, we'll read verse 10 again. But the goat which on on which the lot fell to be for Azazel shall be presented alive before Yahuwah to make an atonement with him and to let him go for Azazel into the wilderness or a.k.a. desert. And Aharon shall bring the bullock of the sin offering which is for him and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before Yahuwah, and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put incense upon the fire before Yahuwah, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. And it is uh, it is kind of interesting. I'm just going to be honest, it's pretty interesting. Um, if you remember what we read in... Uh, if you're with us during the Exodus readings, when we were in Exodus 31, what uh, what comprised this incense? Um, it is kind of interesting. What, uh, yeah, what was burning in the um, the tabernacle? Uh, the incense. So pretty, pretty crazy. No, I'm not gonna say crazy. That's not crazy. It's, it's this is Yahuwah's. This is Yahuwah's uh, his doing. But I just think it's really interesting considering what we've all been taught about uh, certain herbs. Um, and then here it is, you know, being burned in the tabernacle. So if you want to reference that, uh, just take a look at uh, Exodus chapter. Is it chapter 30 or 31? Uh, let's see. Holy anointing oil. Oh, it's 30. I'm sorry. Exodus 30. Yeah. We'll just take a look at what was in there real quick. So, yeah, so this is the incense that's being, right? So, moreover, Yahweh spake unto Moshe, saying, Take thou also unto the principal spices of pure myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet cinnamon, half so much, even 250 shekels, of sweet calamus. Now, this is, if you look at the Hebrew here, it's cannabosum, which, if you do some research on that, that's what I'm talking about, which is really interesting and in how we've all been brought up to uh, demonize cannabosum, which is a.k.a. cannabis, 250 shekels, and of cassia, 500 shekels, after the shekel of the sanctuary, and an oil, and of oil, olive, and hen. So, uh, pretty interesting. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his fingers seven times. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Yashrael and because of their transgressions and all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the assembly that remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the assembly when he goes in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Yashrael. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before Yahuwah and make an atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his fingers seven times and cleanse it and hollow it from the uncleanness of the children of Yashrael. 
And when he has made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the assembly and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Now, here we go. This is what I was talking about. And Aharon shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Yashrael and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him by the... And send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. That's interesting, right? Why a fit man? You know, I want to take a look at the KJV really quickly. So that's 16. Oops. That was 1621. Hand of a fit man. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. So this is like a desert, right? And he shall let go the goat and he shall let go the goat into the wilderness. Yeah. The wilderness. I think this was like more like desert. Let me just look at it real quickly. Yeah, wilderness, okay, Midbar, yeah, that's definitely, uh, it could be translated as wilderness, desert, um, uninhabited land, wilderness, right, okay. All right. Verse 23, And Aharon shall come into the tabernacle of the assembly, and shall put off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place, and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place, and put on his garments, and come forth, and offer his burnt offering, and the burnt offering of the people, and make an atonement for himself and for the people. And the fat of the sin offering shall he burn upon the altar. And he that let go the goat for Azazel shall wash his clothes, and bathe his flesh in water, and afterward come into the camp. And the bullock for the sin offering, and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall one carry forth without the camp, and they shall burn in the fire their skins, their flesh, and their dung. And he that burns them shall wash his clothes, and bathe his flesh in water, and afterward he shall come into the camp. And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, Ye shall afflict your souls and do, do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourns among you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that ye may be clean from all your sins before Yahuwah. It shall be a Shabbat of rest unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. So we... Um, you know, we'll talk more about this when we get to Leviticus 23 with the um, uh, all the feast days. But, um, you know, it, people, I've heard the debate both sides, you know, afflict, what afflicting your souls means on the Day of Atonement. Uh, most people would agree that one of the best ways to afflict your soul is to fast that day. Uh, some people would argue, hey, it's, uh, you know, it's a... It's a feast day of Yahweh. It's not necessarily a feast day. It's it's a moed, but you know that's not a day for fasting. So I've seen both sides of it. Um, until I'm persuaded otherwise, I feel that fasting is a good thing for that day. Um, so yeah, like I said, we'll talk more about it in a few weeks when we get to chapter twenty-three. And the priest whom he shall anoint and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead shall make make the atonement and shall put on the linen clothes even the holy garments and he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary and he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the assembly and for the altar and he shall make an atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly and this shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make an atonement for the children of Yashrael for their sins once a year and he did as Yahuwah commanded Moshe so, you know, praise, again, praise be to Yahuwah that we have our eternal high priest, Messiah Yahushua, our, our, our Messiah, um, that, uh, you know, he did this once and for all for us, and he doesn't have to do it year after year after year, and, uh, man, praise be to Yahuwah that we have that forgiveness, and we have such a great high priest that, 
has done so for us. So I'm into that. All right, so oh, one quick thing that's also interesting about the Day of Atonement, we'll talk again about this when we get to Leviticus 23, but, you know, just I was just thinking about this while I was kind of doing this study, and this is Leviticus 23. Something really interesting about the Septuagint version. Uh, yeah, the Septuagint version, this is the Greek scriptures. This is more than likely what the... Uh, what was available during the time of the apostles and the time of Messiah Yahusha. Um, but uh, the the Septuagint, I, I feel like, is a little more reliable. Um, it's 1,100 years older than the Masoretic. The Masoretic is where we get uh, the manuscript for the KJV, um, the Sefer, uh, you, know, most, you know, most of the scriptures we read today. But the Septuagint is... Yeah, it's like 1,100 years older. So anyways, something interesting in talking about the Day of Atonement. Here at the end of it, verse 32, it says, It shall be a holy Sabbath to you, and ye shall humble your souls. From the ninth day of the month, from evening to evening, ye shall keep your Sabbaths. So it's really interesting that it's multiple, it's not multiple, it's um, pluralized here. The word Sabbath you know, it doesn't say in the in the Masoretic. It just says you shall keep your Sabbath, right? But in the in the Septuagint, which I think feels more reliable, it says Sabbaths. So I know there's kind of a debate going on out there, and you know whether Sabbath we celebrate it from evening to evening or morning to morning or just morning to evening. Um, I find this kind of a kind of an interesting uh, perspective here. Uh, and this is why I've continued. This is one of the bigger reasons why I've continued to do it from evening to evening, regardless of when a day starts and when a day ends. It says right here, "From evening to evening, ye shall keep your sabbaths." So it seems to sp- speak pretty loudly to me, and um, I'm still open to being uh, convinced otherwise. But uh, for now, uh, I think this is uh, this is a pretty good uh, witness here. So uh, it's kind of off topic, but. You know, while we're talking about the Day of Atonement, I just kind of wanted to bring that up. I thought it was, thought it was kind of interesting. So, let's uh, move on to chapter seventeen. Give me just a second. Well, let me just say this: calendar stuff. Uh, when a day starts, when you celebrate your Shabbat, you know. Listen, I'm just, um, I'm just proud of you. I hate that word, proud of you, proud. I'm just ecstatic that you want to celebrate his feast days, that you want to celebrate his Sabbath, um, and that you're just doing it because I'm not going to argue with you, you know, if you want to do it morning to morning or just morning to evening. Listen, I'm just thrilled to be called your brother uh, in this late hour when most people don't even believe or even care to believe uh, that you would even want to do it. So that's not going to be a point of contention for me at all. All right, so, okay, um, Leviticus 17, and, um, yeah, Leviticus 17, 1. And Yahweh spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto El Aharon, and unto his sons, and unto all the children of Yashrael, and say unto them, This is the thing which Yahweh has commanded, saying, What man soever there be of the house of Yashrael that kills an ox or a lamb, or goat in the camp, or that kills it out of the camp, and brings it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the assembly to offer an offering unto Yahuwah before the tabernacle of Yahuwah, blood shall be imputed unto that man. He has shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among his people. So this is really interesting. This is something I didn't really see uh, last year when I went through this. Um, so this is saying that if you sacrifice one of the three animals, which are the sacrificial animals, ox, lamb, or goat, and you don't bring it to the tabernacle, you've, you're have you cut off from the people. Like, that's pretty big, right? That's pretty interesting. So think about this. Remember, I, I've been really thinking about our our society that is just... All about eating meat, 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 meat. Let me just say this ahead of time. Listen, eating meat is totally biblical and totally 
per the Torah, right? But I think it's got to be done a certain way. And hear me out. Just hear me out for a second. I'm not here to I'm not here to convince you about changing any of your eating habits or make you feel this way or that way. All I want is the truth. Okay. So all I'm here to do is is talk about what the scripture says and what I think it's saying. Now, remember, remember in when they were coming out of Egypt, um, and they had they had I mean they said they had flocks beyond measure. I mean, tons of, you know, flocks of cattle and, and goats and sheep. And remember in the wilderness, they were like lusting for meat, They're like, give us meat, give us meat. Right. And, or remember when they didn't have any food and like, what are we going to eat? And it's like, you know, if eating just cow, eating beef and, you know, sh- you know, lamb or, or, or goat was just totally cool, whatever. Why would they be lusting? Why wouldn't they just go sac- you know, kill some of these cows and just make a big barbecue? But they didn't, and they acted like there was no meat until the quail came down, right? And Yahuwah got upset. He was mad. He's like, you lusted after flesh, you know? So I'm going to have flesh coming out of your nostrils. You're coming out of your ears. So here's what it's saying is if you're going to eat ox, lamb, or goat, and you don't bring it to the tabernacle first, you're cut off from the people. What is it actually saying? Let's look at another passage about this. Um, it's kind of similar. Deuteronomy 12, 11 through 23. Uh, then there shall be a place which Yahweh your Elohim shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. Thither, so this is talking about Jerusalem. There, right? Thither you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and the heath offerings of your hand and all your choice vows which you vow unto Yahuwah. And ye shall rejoice before Yahweh your Elohim, you and your sons and your daughters and your men servants and your maid servants and the Levite that is within your gates, for as much as he hath no part nor inheritance with you, take heed to thyself that thou offer not thy burnt offerings in every place that thou seest. Right. So here, this is kind of going along with what we just said right here. Um, you don't just uh, you know you don't just eat this wherever you want. Okay. So take heed. Okay. Verse 14, but in the place which Yahuwah shall choose in one of thy tribes, there shalt thou offer thy burnt offerings, and there shalt thou do all that I command thee. Notwithstanding, thou mayest kill and eat flesh in all thy gates. So here we go. So inherit saying, you can eat meat, right? Whenever you want. Whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, according to the blessing of Yahuwah the Elohim, which he hath given thee. The unclean and the clean may eat thereof, as, now it's telling you what kind of meat you can eat, right? As the roebuck and of the heart, right? So like deer, deer meat. You go out and go go be like Esau. Go I'm not I'm not saying you'd be like Esau if you're a hunter. I'm just saying go out and hunt some deer and bring it back, right? Uh, only ye shall not eat the blood thereof, ye shall pour it upon the earth as water. Thou mayest not eat within thy gates the tithe of thy corn, or thy wine, or thy oil, or the firstlings of the herds, or of thy flocks, nor any of thy vows which thou vowest nor thy free will offerings or heave offerings offering of thine hand. But thou must eat them before Yahweh thy Elohim in the place with which Yahweh thy Elohim shall choose you and your son and your daughter and your men servant and your maid servant and the Levite that is within your gates, and you shall rejoice before Yahweh thy Elohim in all that thou puttest thine hands unto. Take heed to thyself that thou forsake not the Levite as long as thou livest upon the earth. When Yahuwah thy Elohim shall enlarge thy border, as he hath promised thee, and thou shalt say, I will eat flesh, because thy soul longeth to eat flesh, thou mayest eat flesh. So again, eating meat, totally biblical, Torah, totally in the Torah, right? Whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. If the place which Yahuwah thy Elohim hath chosen to put his name there be too far from thee, then thou shalt kill of thy herd and of thy flock, which Yahweh hath given thee, as I have commanded thee, and thou shalt eat in thy gates whatsoever thy soul lusteth after. Even as the roebuck and the heart is eaten, so thou shalt eat them. The unclean and the clean shall eat them of, shall eat of them alike. Only be sure that thou eat not the blood, for the blood is the life, and thou mayest not eat the life with the flesh. So, you know, when it says right here, um, whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, Hey, maybe that does mean that you can just, you know, if you've got cattle, you can just slaughter it whenever you want to. And, and uh, um, you know, a sheep, you can just, 
or lamb. You can just slaughter it whenever you want to and eat it whenever you want to. Um, some would say, hey, you'll know. He's saying right here, even as the roebuck, right? Like like deer, like it's it needs to be an animal like that. So it's not really cut and clear or clear cut. But again, I, I it just really it really makes me question, you know, how often we're to eat meat like that. Is it just is this normal every day? Just you know, throwing meat in your mouth. I mean, is that how he wants it to be? Maybe it is. Maybe it absolutely is. It's just a question I have, and it's just something I just wanted to bring up. I don't have all the answers. Like I said from the get-go, I'm just a student. I am not some great teacher. I have some questions um, because I'm at a point where I realize that almost everything we've been taught in this world is almost false, right? Now, I will say that there is this push in, you know, in this New Age movement for vegan, you know, like substitute cheese and substitute meat and i mean that is that is not what i'm talking about at all i think yahuwah has made amazing animals to produce amazing things for us like cows with their milk and you know cheese um same thing with goats and you know goat's milk and goat's cheese and and, you know chickens and eggs and i'm all about eating the fruits of these animals um but you know we're so far removed from an agricultural lifestyle. If you think about like cattle and, and, and chickens, when, when you, I mean, if you think about how much milk, like a certain cattle can produce for you, like, you know, this cow, you know, each cow can produce, uh, I don't even know. Cause I'm far removed from it, but let's say 20 gallons of milk, you know, in a month, I don't even know how, how accurate that is. But, you know, for you to be like, Hey, I will forego 20 gallons of milk this month. I'm going to sacrifice this animal so I can eat it in, you know, one or two days. That is a sacrifice. It really is. And maybe that's one of the reasons why they didn't just kill all their cattle when they or kill some of the cattle when they came out of Egypt when they were when their souls were lusting after flesh. And so Yahuwah sent them the uh, the quail. Just something something to consider. But uh, yeah. Weird, uh, weird rabbit hole, but I just really wanted to talk about it. Um, yeah, so Leviticus 17 5 to the end that the children of Yashrael may bring their sacrifices, which they offer in the open field, even that they may bring them in, unto Yahuwah, unto the door of the tabernacle of the assembly, unto the priest, and offer them for peace offerings unto Yahuwah. And the priest shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar of Yahuwah at the door of the tabernacle of the assembly and burn the fat for a sweet savor unto Yahuwah. One last thing on the meat thing. Um, Listen, uh, you know, I mean, just from, from speaking from personal experience, I've eaten meat almost my entire life. And just recently, uh, well, a couple years ago, uh, I went like two years vegetarian, not vegan. I'm not like that, but I went vegetarian. I really enjoyed not eating flesh. Um, and for the last uh, s- eight months or so, I've been vegetarian. But let me tell you something. Like on Passover, when I ate lamb, it was incredible because it was something special. It was a special occasion. Uh, it was like I'd never eaten meat in my entire life, and it was just amazing, right? I don't know. Maybe it should be a little more for special occasions. I don't know. I, I'm again. I am not here to tell you how to do anything. I'm just here, just bringing up some things to consider. That's all. Okay. And the priest shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar of Yah of Yahuwah at the door of the tabernacle of the assembly and burn the fat for a sweet savor unto Yahuwah. And they shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils after whom they have gone a whoring. This shall be a statute forever unto them throughout their generations. And this gone a whoring thing, I mean, this is part of coming out of her, my people, because the world has gone a whoring after the ways of devils, essentially. Uh, and so this is part of um, not being defiled with women, right? Which, uh, you know, coming out of her not being defiled with women, that has to do with Proverbs uh, 6, 20 through 24. Let me read that real quick for you. My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart and tie them about thy neck. 
When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life. What? To keep thee from the evil woman. Come out of her from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. And that's really what the whole book of Revelation is about. It's about two women, the faithful woman and the whore, the harlot woman. Not defiled with women, but the woman. <clears throat> Leviticus 17, 8, And you shall say unto them, Whatsoever man there be of the house of Yashrael, or of the strangers which sojourn among you, that offers a burnt offering or sacrifice, and brings it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the assembly, to offer it unto Yahuwah, even that man shall be cut off from among his people. There it is again, right? So essentially, again, if you want to eat, this is what the Torah is saying right here, is if you want to eat an ox, a lamb, or a sheep, was it? Oh, man. Yeah, ox, lamb, or goat. You need to bring it to the tabernacle now. Of course, we don't have one right now, so maybe that's maybe that's all all bets are off right now. I, again, I'm just just some things to consider. Okay, Leviticus seventeen ten, and whatsoever man there be of the house of Yashrael or of the strangers that sojourn among you that eats any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eats the blood, and will cut him off from among his people, for the soul of the flesh is in the blood. He and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood of him that makes an atonement in the soul. I mean. Therefore, I said unto the children of Yashrael, No soul of you shall eat blood, neither shall any stranger that sojourns among you eat blood. And whatsoever man there be of the children of Yashrael, or of the stranger that sojourns among you, which hunts and catches any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cover it with dust. For it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. So, the life of our bodies is in the in the blood, and there's something to that, and that's why these sickos that run this world that do disgusting things, you know, with people, children, sacrifices, eating blood, it's all the same stuff they've been doing for thousands of years. You ever wonder why these celebrities don't looks like they never age? Well, it's because they're renewing their fleshly life with the blood. They're preserving it. Why do you think all these sickos live to be? I shouldn't even. I shouldn't talk like that. Well, I'm sorry. Why do you think these people live to be, you know, a hundred years, hundred and ten years, right? Because they're drinking blood. There's this thing. There's this new beauty, um, new uh, beauty trend. Um, fashion trend, beauty trend, whatever you want to call it, where they literally let you, they let out some of your blood and they like put it on your face and you leave it on for like uh, I don't know for some time and it like like wrinkles just go away and they're like oh it's like magic right well it's because the blood is alive right and it it, it does work I'm sure it works but I mean think about what these people go through for their image for their fleshly image, you know, and it's just so, it's so temporary and they just have no idea that we're supposed to be just be sojourners here, you know, and I feel bad. I really actually feel bad for them because they're so lost that they would let out some of their blood to remove some of the wrinkles on their face. And there's just, it's in pop culture, you know, I uh, I remember years ago with when the um, um, that Twilight series came out. You know, in my previous life, you know, I had a girlfriend that was all into that, and she was like, she was like, you know, really intrigued by drinking blood, and like, I'm like, really? Like even then, I was like, really? Ugh, you know. And but apparently, there's a lot of people like this that were just fascinated with it. You know, with this whole vampire thing and drinking blood and living forever and. Well, there's Hollywood romanticizing drinking blood, right? Anyways, there's a lot more we can talk about that, but let's let's not get too deep in that rabbit hole today.
So anyway, so yeah, for it is the life of all flesh. The blood of it is for the life thereof. Therefore I said unto the children of Yashrael, Ye shall eat the blood of no manner of flesh. For the life of all flesh is the blood thereof. Whosoever eats it shall be cut off. And every soul that eats that which died of itself, or that which was torn with beasts, whether it be one of your own country or of a stranger, he shall both wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. Then shall he be clean. But if he wash them not, nor bathe his flesh, then he shall bear his iniquity. Okay. So now we will move on to chapter 18. Okay. All right. Chapter 18. Unlawful sexual relations. Leviticus 18.1 And Yahweh spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto the children of Yashrael, and say unto them, I am Yahuwah Elohim. After the doings of the land of Mitzrayim, wherein ye dwelt, ye shall not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whether I bring you, shall ye not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. Ye shall do my judgments, and guard my ordinances to walk therein. I am Yahuwah Elohim. Ye shall therefore guard my statutes, and... And my judgments, which, if a man do, he shall live in them. I am Yahuwah. So this is obviously a very famous statement. This was uh, um, repeated uh, quite a bit by, uh, uh, let's see here. I've got some uh, some passages I want to read about this. But the Torah is life. Now we were talking about blood and life, the flesh. Well, Torah is the life of man, but more so of the Ruach, right? Let's talk about that. Live an eternal life in the Ruach. Matthew nineteen sixteen through 17. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? Right? He's talking to Messiah. He's like, what can I do to have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is Elohim. But if thou wilt, wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Pretty simple. Amen. That goes along with Revelation twenty two fourteen. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, which is in New Jerusalem, and may enter in through the gates into the city, New Jerusalem. Right? Keeping his commandments. Deuteronomy 4, 1. Now therefore hearken, O Yashrael, unto the statutes and unto the judgments which I teach you, for to do them that ye may live. And go in and possess the land of which Yahuwah your Elohim of your fathers giveth you, which for our day and age will be New Jerusalem. I mean, Deuteronomy 32, 46 through 47. And he said unto them, Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify ye among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. Now, uh, I've been... Um, approached by many about a certain uh, ministry that teaches uh, it's really interesting it's like uh, a lot of us have come out of uh, dispensational dispensational Christianity which basically says you know we're in the age of grace and we only read Paul's letters you know it's Romans through Philemon it's only us you don't you know yeah we you know we follow uh, Jesus but we don't keep uh, any of his commandments or sayings because that was before the cross and Paul was after the cross and I mean so it's uh, it's just like so much chaos right uh, but the, at the end of the day what they do is they just make void the law and be like it's all in the spirit now you just believe and then you just walk according to your heart and whatever else that is so this is a new teaching that it's called you know they call it like you know Mel Melchizedek you know, book of the law versus the book of the covenant and basically, they say that um, it's just the Ten Commandments, right? Everything before the calf, before the golden calf, which throws out, like, a huge portion of the Torah. Um, I mean, it throws out, like, 80% of it. And so it's, I call it, like, a backdoor dispensationalism. But truly, if you want to follow Yahuwah, right, which you shall command your children to observe to do, all the words of this law, right? So that includes what's written in Deuteronomy and in Numbers, uh, in Leviticus, and uh, after um, Exodus 22, 23, whenever the golden calf was. 
for it is not a vain thing for you because it is your life, the whole Torah. Now, obviously, stuff about the, the sacrifices and whatnot, we can't keep that part, but I'll tell you what, I think our attitude should be, let's go through this Torah and let's keep whatever we can. And quite frankly, Torah has been taught to us that it's uh, just the first five books um, of the law, first five books of Moshe, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But even Yahusha said that the book of Psalms was Torah. Uh, you ask, hey, where did he say that? When he said, is it not written in your law that ye are gods? Well, that's in that's in the Psalms, you know, ye are gods. Um so, anyways, that's uh, that's something I've been thinking about. We talked about this a few weeks ago. That you know, the 613 laws—that's a Jewish tradition. There's way more than 613 commandments here in the Torah, uh, and so why it's just 613—it's gonna—it's beyond me. Uh, for those of you that are following these pretty closely, you remember. I mean, we would read one of the 613. And then the very next verse was another commandment, but it wasn't considered one of the 613. And you're like, well, why was this verse a commandment? Why is this verse not a commandment? Why is this part of 613? Why is this not part of the 613? So we're really trying to shed all of Jewish traditions. That's why this last Passover, we didn't do the setter plate. We just did, hey, what does it say in Exodus 12 and 13? Let's do it like that. For it is not a vain thing for you, because is because it is your life. And through this thing, you shall prolong your days in the land, whether you go over the Jordan to possess it. Ezekiel twenty eleven through 13 And I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments for which if a man do, he shall even live in them. Right? So that's what we're talking about here. Which if a man do, he shall live in them. Moreover, also, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign. Right? To be a sign, a mark between me and them that they might know that I am Yahuwah that sanctify them. But the house of Yashorel rebelled against me in the wilderness, and they walked not in my statutes, and they despised my judgments, which if a man do, he shall even live in them. And my Sabbaths they greatly polluted. Then I said, I would pour out my fury upon them in the wilderness to consume them. Now, uh, John 14, 6, Yahushua saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So here, right here, Messiah Yahushua declared himself to be the Torah because the Torah is the way, Psalm 119, verse 1, the truth, Psalm 119, 142, and the life, which we just read a couple of those, which is in Deut Deuteronomy um, 32 and, and a few other places, Deuteronomy 4, verse 1, and uh, quite a few other places. So no man comes unto the Father but by him, by believing on him, Right and uh, believing on his word and keeping his Torah. That is the way to the Father, period. It's always been that way. Uh, nothing's changed. Praise be to Yahuwah. Okay, verse 6. None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am Yahuwah. So now he's going to declare sexual immorality. Now, I'm just going to be honest. Interesting questions, right? Maybe you guys can help me out. Again, I'm just a student of the Torah. Um, not trying to act like I'm some great teacher. Why? We're about to read, you know, you can't sleep with your sister, you can't sleep with your mom, you can't sleep with your cousin, um, you know, such and such. Why was Abraham allowed to marry his sister? And then, you know, just a few generations later, you've got this law. Because um, the Torah, to me, is eternal. Um, so maybe you guys can help me out. I have a, I, that's a, that's a question of mine. Um, so yeah, I'll, actually I'll, maybe I'll take a look at the chat here in a second. Maybe if any of you guys uh, can help me out. That's a question I've never been able to answer. Now, when someone asks me the same thing about Adam and Eve, well, it's like, w what are you going to do? Right? You have two people. I mean, how else are we going to populate? But when we get to Abraham's time, is there someone else he can choose other than Sarah? I have to imagine, right? Maybe want maybe Yahuwah wanted the seed of Abraham, that lineage, to be pure from from uh, you know from that standpoint. I don't know, just something to consider. But um, I am interested if any of you guys have. Uh, uh, maybe I need to wait a little longer. Okay, 
So the nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother shall you not uncover. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. Now, this term uncovering your nakedness, this is for a sexual act. And that's why a lot of people, when they when we talk about the sin of Ham, and it said he's, he uncovered his father's nakedness, um, that's also a term for sleeping with his mother. So it's possible that's what he did, or it's possible that Noah got drunk and was literally naked in his tent and was like, and Ham was like, you know, Shem, Yepheth, you all need to come check this out. This is hilarious. Carly McGinn, it says, I thought Sarah was Abraham's niece, his brother's daughter. No, it definitely, is, she's de she was definitely his half-sister. Um, yeah. Definitely his half-sister. Yeah, that's right. Leah and Rachel were twins. That's true. Yep. That's very true. Uh, Ace Caliber, because the Torah was not available then. Well, that's not true because the Torah was well alive uh, in Abraham's day. Um, and we know that through uh, Genesis 26, 5, when he was talking to Isaac, it says, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws, which the Hebrew word here is Torah. So he kept his Torah. Abraham kept his Torah. Maybe that part of the Torah wasn't written yet. I'm not sure. Yeah. Anyways, okay, let's keep going. All right, the nakedness of your father's woman shall you not uncover. It is your father's nakedness. The nakedness of your sister, the daughter of your father, or the daughter of your mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness you shall not uncover. All right, yeah, the nakedness of your sister. So again, Sarah was Abraham's half-sister. Yeah. The nakedness of your sister, the daughter of your father, or the daughter of your mother. Yeah. So, Yeah, here we go. Genesis 20, verse 12. And yet indeed she is my sister. This is Abraham talking about Sarah. She indeed is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. So listen, I mean, this questioning here isn't like questioning Avraham. He is like, I am nobody to question Avraham. I'm just wondering like why it was okay for Avraham and then why later maybe this maybe this part was added later I, I i'm just you know just asking a question um yeah hey so all of you are saying it's because the torah was written after avraham um yeah. All right. Well, we'll talk about this in the, the, the comment section after this is uploaded. I really would like to hear a lot of your guys' input on this because it's a question that I cannot answer at this point. So just being honest, and I may be, maybe I'm just not learned. Maybe I've got a lot to learn. Maybe. The nakedness of your sister, the daughter of your father, or the daughter of your mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness you shall not uncover. The nakedness of your son's daughter or of your daughter's daughter, even their nakedness you shall not uncover, for theirs is your own nakedness, right? The nakedness of your father's woman's daughter, begotten of your father, she is your sister, you shall not uncover her nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's sister, for she is your father's near kinswoman. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister, for she is even your mother's near kinswoman. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's brother. You shall not approach to his woman. She is your aunt. 
You shall not uncover the nakedness of your daughter-in-law. She is your son's woman. You shall not uncover her nakedness. So this is like this is like some obvious stuff, right? This is this is why I love Torah. It's just cut and dry. Like, don't do this. Don't sleep with your mom. Don't sleep with your sister. Don't sleep with your aunt. You're like, awesome. And we as humans, we need these like clear-cut rules, right? You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's woman. It is your brother's nakedness. You shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter. Neither shall you take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness, for they are her near kinswoman. It is wickedness. Right? So, yeah, you can't be with a woman and her daughter at the same time. It is wickedness. Neither shall you take a woman to her sister to vex her, to uncover her nakedness beside the other in her lifetime. Neither shall you take a woman to her sister to vex her, to uncover her nakedness besides the other in her lifetime. Well, that would that would be Leah and Rachel. Maybe yeah, maybe maybe this stuff was uh, was added afterwards. I'm I'm okay with that. I guess I can handle that. Also, you shall not approach unto a woman to uncover her nakedness as long as she is put apart for her uncleanness. Moreover, you shall not lie carnally with your neighbor's woman to defile yourself with her. That's adultery. And you shall not let any of your seed pass through the fire to Molech. Neither shall you profane the name of your Elohim, I am Yahuwah. Now this is when they were burning their sons in the fire, right? This is the stuff that they were doing in the land of Canaan before they moved in. And sure enough, you know, it got reinstituted, especially during the time of Manasseh. Um, you know, imagine what kind of doctrine they would have. I was actually talking to a, a brother. Uh, his name is also Adam. And we've been, we, he, he just moved here. We've been hanging out. And um, we were talking about like the mindset. I mean, can you imagine the mindset of being like, here, here's my baby put it on this fire altar to Molech. They probably really were were thinking that they were doing something good. I mean, imagine they I would imagine they would have to think that they were doing something good like I'm going to sacrifice this child so that the rest of my family can eat, right? Because they were sacrificing it to, you know, the god of uh, weather, you know, Baal, the god of weather or whatever, so that they would have enough weather for their crops and whatnot. Because they totally, you know, obviously went away from Yahuwah, so they were sacrificing to these uh, false false gods. I mean, the imagine the insanity, the mindset that these people were in to actually have their seed pass through the fire to Molech. You shall not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. So this is uh, how we know that uh, I don't care what you think of uh, you know the current administration that's running this country. Um, we have legalized we have legalized homosexuality, and Yahuwah calls it an abomination. If this if this administration was really serving Yahuwah, abortions would be stopped instantly. I mean, every single Planned Parenthood, you know, closed down. These doctors that, you know, do it, you know, uh, and would continue to do it, uh, jailed. Um, these marriages would be canceled immediately, but it's not, and they're not. So it's going to keep happening, you know. We're living in the last days. This is this wickedness, you know, woe to them that call evil good and good evil. You know, they say love is love. Is it? Do you even know what do we even know what love means? Biblically speaking? It's wickedness. It's abomination. Straight up. Neither shall you lie with any beast to defile yourself. Now, at the same time, you know, am I condemning people? Because like, you know, we are all equally guilty in sin so a murderer you know a murderer is guilty uh, a homosexual is guilty a drunkard is equally guilty um you know a liar a thief of you know a a um uh, a covetous person an idolater you know people are equally guilty across the board right but i know we're living in the days where this is starting to be accepted because it's, well, part of normal society now. It's even pop culture. Like, it's even, 
I gotta tell you, man, you know, I'm 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 done now, but I was uh, back in college last year because I was learning, you know, stuff for the ministry to do a graphic design and whatnot to uh, help improve the 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 visuals here of the channel, um, and you know, being in class with these 18 to 22 year olds and probably half of them were, you know, like this and it was just like pop culture. You know, it just, it was beyond me that, that how much things have changed. Um, you know, it became normal on TV, like what, 15, 20 years ago. And it's just like breeding. It's like breeding this anyways. We all know, everybody that's watching this right now, you know it's wrong, so I'm just preaching to the choir, so let's move on. Leviticus 18.23, Neither shall you lie with any beast to defy yourself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. It is confusion. This is bestiality, right? This is having intercourse with animals. So, I mean, what else do we say here, right? Defile not yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. So they were doing all this stuff, right? Uh, the Kenizzites and the Perizzites and the Yevusites and all these people, they were all doing this nasty stuff. And the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomits out her inhabitants. Ye shall therefore guard my statutes and my judgments, and ye shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation, nor any stranger that sojourns among you. For for all these abominations have the men of the land done which were before you, and the land is defiled." that the land spew not you out also when you defile it, as it spewed out the nations that were before you. For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them, shall be cut off from among their people. Therefore shall ye guard my ordinance, that ye commit not any one of these abominable customs which were committed before you, that ye defile not yourselves therein. I am Yahuwah Elohim. Pretty severe. Pretty serious. What do you say to all that kind of stuff, you know? <sighs> Anyways, so a lot of interesting topics tonight. And, um, you know, I pray that uh, maybe maybe you've given you some things to consider. Maybe everything you already knew, maybe, um, I don't know. But some interesting things that for sure. Yeah. Hey, Calibur, Disney movie, The Beast and the Princess. Yeah, well, there you go. I mean, think about uh, think about what the phones do now. They they change your face into like animals and stuff. It's just so weird, right? Yeah. I imagine a lot of this stuff was happening before the flood. You know, in Jasher it says not only did the angels mate with the women, but they also taught the mixture of different animals and stuff. And anyways, anyways, but. So, um, well, brothers and sisters, that is it for this evening, and um, we, we should be back on track this Friday night for week 30, and like I said, we got a few more weeks in Leviticus, and we are on to Numbers, and uh, then we'll get into Deuteronomy, which is my favorite, so I'll just take a look at the chat here really quickly, so if you're watching this as a recording, uh, I'm going to be hanging out the chat for maybe just a few minutes, and we'll be finished up, so let's see. Uh, Clifton Breedlove, POTV. I can't find the verse in Exodus, but I'm pretty sure Yahuwah made a covenant with the people of Israel, which is what actually freed them from Egypt and gave the Torah. Now, I hear you. I, I mean, I, I hear you guys that, like, the Torah was officially given, you know, um, at Mount Sinai. However, the Torah was well active before then. Um, it's very apparent in Jasher and Jubilees that during the life of, um, I mean, even in Jubilees, uh, I think it's chapter 7 or 8 or 9, but it talks about how Noah gave all the commandments and, and ordinances and what to all three of his sons, right? And that's why nobody has any excuse because, you know, Yahweh was like, hey, I, I, I gave these all to your forefathers and they transgressed my ways and they decided not to follow my ways. And so it's like, what do you want me to do? Uh, the Torah is eternal. It's... 
you know, the book of um, the book of uh, uh, Proverbs says that the Torah is light. And one of my thought processes lately is that in the first day, when it says uh, Yahuwah separated the light from the darkness, you know, um, I think that has something to do with the Torah. But, yeah, interesting. Uh, Jesus is mighty God. Do you believe Sunday keeping is the mark of the beast along other false teachings of men? Um, here's what I believe. I believe that there is a separation of you're either keeping, you either have the mark of Yahuwah or you have the mark of the beast. Um, now, it the mark of Yahuwah is by keeping his ways. Deuteronomy 6 makes it very clear uh, that his commandments shall be for a sign upon our hand and fl- frontlets between our eyes. So that's your hand and your forehead, just like uh, in Revelation 13, the, the mark of the beast is in your hand and your forehead as well. With that being said, I believe fully that the beast is Rome and that they have said on record that their mark, their ecclesiastical mark is Sunday. That's the mark of their authority. You know, could there be a day coming soon where people have to keep Sunday? You know, I don't know. It's it's certainly interesting. Um, this is a topic I've talked about quite a bit over the years. And, um, you know, if you watch the very controversial video I did uh, a while, a couple months ago, back in November, December, uh, it's called like the Antichrist uh, Spirit Revealed. Um, you know, I do believe that the image of the beast is the false messiah that has been perpetrated by the, the Vatican, the Catholic Church, the beast, um, the false messiah that you know, did away with the law, did away with the commandments. And, you know, all I got to do is just, you know, love. Um, you know, I do believe that's the image of the beast. But um, whether it's, if it's just, you know, to, to say it's just this, the Sunday Sabbath versus the Saturday, I think it's a little more than that. But I think it's definitely part of it. Um, but, yeah. And listen, you know, as far as, uh, you know, as far as um, a chip or a vaccine or, or whatever, listen, there, there's, there might be a day coming very soon that uh, you've got to take one of these things in order to continue in commerce. And yeah, definitely don't take it. You know, is that the mark of the beast, though? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So anyways, uh, let's see. Hang tight. Yeah, yeah, Jackson, do you have any thoughts about May 14th global gathering by the Pope? It's something to look at for sure. Um, You know, over the last few years, I've focused more on instead of focusing on what the world is doing, just just truly just focusing on, on the word. And, you know, letting Yah reveal to us when things are going to happen. But, you know, that is an interesting day. I think it's uh, the anniversary of Israel and all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? A big red G, I have a theory that one of the wings of the beast is the U.S. military. You know. Uh, I, I think that the beast, the Vatican, controls a lot more than a lot of us think. You know, I think the United States is modern-day Egypt in all this. Uh, some would say it's Babylon. Um, you know, that's a whole other topic. I, <laughs> I, you know, if you just use what the Scripture says about Babylon, I think it, it says something very specific. But, um, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, the United States is definitely an arm of the beast, could even be the second beast. I mean, I, I don't even know. You know, I, I, we'll uh, we're gonna get more into that when we get there in Revelation. But um, so Crystal says the Pope thing has been changed to October. I didn't hear that. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, you know, and, and there's a lot of good stuff out there about uh, transhumanism and Neuralink and all this kind of stuff. And man, I used to watch all that stuff and really get into it, but. 
I don't know. I stopped focusing so much on what the world was doing and more so on what the word says and letting Yahuwah you know, tell us, you know, when things are coming. Anyways, so we're going to end it here. Uh, brothers and sisters, it was a pleasure uh, diving into the word with you. And um, I pray that Yahuwah continue to open our eyes and ears to his, the, to his Torah, to the wonderful uh, majesty of his Torah, and uh, that we be found worthy as we are waiting for his return. So, um, yeah, with that... Um, here, let's just see the last question. Adam, let's see, left standing. Adam, who do you think is the ten horns of the beast of the earth? The fourth beast of Daniel technically only has seven horns. So that's, um, you should actually watch, um, there's a video, uh, let me just show you this real quick, because, you know, honestly, if we're going to understand the end times, we have to understand who the beast is and who uh, Mystery Babylon is. Um, otherwise, you're just going to get totally confused. Uh, let me show you. Okay, so first of all, as far as the mark, whoever asked me the question about the mark, um, here I go into a little more. It's only 18 minutes, but uh, avoiding it's called Avoiding the Mark of the Beast. I did that about a month ago. You should really check that out. Um, hang on. Let's see where I want to show you. So the Antichrist Revealed I was telling you about earlier. Um, that's right here. Um, what else? Oh, here we go. Mystery Babylon, 35 minutes. Uh, if you just let the word do the talking, uh, it's very clear who Mystery Babylon is. Now, again, it's easy to say, I, I, will, I will say this, that, you know, almost the entire world is like a daughter of Babylon. So you could say America is like a part of Babylon, all that kind of stuff. But there's only one mystery, mother of harlots and abominations. And if you let the word do the speaking, uh, I think you can, you'll be able to see who the, the um, harlot is. But uh, uh, what we were talking about right here. The Beast Unlocked, right here. Rev unlocked, the Beast of Revelation, right here. Um, we talked about the ten horns and the three that were plucked up by the roots. Um, it was essentially the uh, after the, um, what was it, 430 AD or something like that, you had the ten, uh, it was basically the ten, um, um, let's say communities, communities? He had the ten separate tribes, essentially, of... Uh, of the Roman Empire, uh, like, you know, the Heruli, the Vandals, um, the um, uh, Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, you know, all these, yeah, 10 of them, and three of them were absolutely annihilated by the papacy. They are plucked up by the roots, as it says in Daniel. They are no, tra I mean, they were completely annihilated. There was no remnant that they were entirely cut off, um, and it was, they mostly, they did it because uh, these three, uh, groups. It was the who, uh, who was it? Um, uh, let's see, who was it that were killed? Let me see. Let's. Where was it? Here we go. Here we go. So. You had yeah the Alamanni, the Franks, the uh, Burgundians, the Suevi, the Vandals, the Visigoths, the Anglo-Saxons, the Ostrogoths, the Lombardi, and the Heruli. And I believe it was the Heruli. Who was it? There was three of them that were plucked up by the roots that were killed. Um, anyways, just it's 22 minutes. It's a really short video. Just go through it, um, and you should be able to answer all your questions. But anyways, we're going to end there, and... Uh, Brothers and sisters, hey, blessings to you, and hope to see you guys Friday night. We will continue on our Revelation study. We're going to be in chapter 8 of Revelation, and then we're going to be doing the Torah portion afterwards. So, Yevarechecha Yahuwah veyeshmerecha, Yaer Yahuwah panav elecha vechnuneka, Yisa Yahuwah panav elecha veyashem lecha shalom. Yahuwah bless you and keep you. Yahuwah make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yahuwah lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Brothers and sisters, I love you very much. And uh, we'll do a quick prayer and we'll do the song of Moshe and we'll end tonight. So let's bow our hearts. Heavenly Father, Yahuwah Most High, we just come before you again. We thank you truly for allowing us to study your word, to even give us a heart that desires to study your word, because we know that this is a blessing and this is absolutely from you. We thank you. We 
pray that our lives are worthy of the calling and that we bear much fruit uh, as we continue in belief in Messiah Yahusha and to walk as he walked. We are waiting for you, as your scripture says to do, and we are hoping that your return is nigh, bringing judgment. In Yahusha's name, Amen and Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, Shalom, and we'll see you soon. I sing to Yahuwah, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. Yah is my strength and song, and he has become my deliverance. He is my El, and I praise him. Elohim of my Father And I exalt Him Yahuwah is a man of battle Yahuwah is His name He has cast Pharaoh's chariots And his army into the sea and his chosen officers are drowned in the sea of reeds. The depths covered them. They went down to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O oh Yahuwah, has become great in power. Your right hand, O oh Yahuwah, has crushed the enemy. And in the greatness of your excellence, you pulled down those who rose up against you. You sent forth your wrath. It consumed them like stubble. And with the wind of your nostrils, the waters were heaped up The floods stood like a wall The depths became stiff In the heart of the sea The enemy said, I pursue, I overtake I divide the spoil My being is satisfied on them I draw out my sword My hand destroys them you blew with your wind, the sea covered them They sank like lead in the mighty waters Who is like you, O oh, Yahuwah, among the mighty ones? Who is like you, great in Kodesha? Awesome in praises Working wonders You stretched out your right hand The earth swallowed them In your kindness You led the people Whom you have redeemed In your strength You guided them To your Kodesh dwelling Peoples heard They trembled Anguish gripped The inhabitants of Pelasheth then the chiefs of Edom were troubled, the mighty men of Moab. Trembling grips them, all the inhabitants of Canaan melted. Fear and dread fell on them by the greatness of your arm. They are as silent as a stone. Until your people pass over, O oh, Yahuwah. Until the people whom you have bought pass over. You bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance. 
place, O oh, Yahuwah, which you have made for your own dwelling. The meek dash, O oh, Yahuwah, which your hands have prepared. Yahuwah reigns forever and ever.